Fellowship. Welcome by Anskak and welcome to church. Family, I greet you all in the wonderful name of our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Last week, we kicked off a new sermon series titled Post-Pandemic Me. Post-Pandemic Me. And as preachers, uh, we were led to this series uh, because as we got together to discuss and pray through what God would have us journey through as a church, we reflected on the fact that so many of us post-pandemic are not okay. We are not okay. And very often we struggle to live in the trust and the hope and the victory that we as Christians have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That same victory that we sang about this morning in these songs. We struggle to live that out in our day-to-day lives. We believe it, but we struggle to live it out. And this has especially been the case in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic, because for many, for many, the past three years have been very much a culmination and a concentration of so many of our fears, worries, and anxieties. And eventually, it's as if our brains which as a survival instinct are wired to focus on the negatives, well, they all add that up and you start to feel like, man, your fears and your worries, it's as if they're coming to be. In some sense, because we are still reeling from the trauma of these past three years, and because we very often haven't given these wounds to our Lord and Savior Jesus to heal, we are walking around wounded, scared, fearful, anxious, worried, and hurt. And so that's why we felt led to do a sermon series that would really directly speak to this. And as I mentioned last week, our prayer for this series is that it would serve as a type of debriefing of the past three years, and that this time would serve as a time of healing in our lives. Amen? That we would know that He sees us, that He is for us, and that we would confidently look ahead to the healing and restoration that He has already begun. We are praying that this time would serve as a healing conclusion to, in many senses, the painful chapter of the past three years, and that faith and hope and trust would again rise up in us as we look to what God is calling us to next as individual believers, but also as the body of Christ here at Rooted Fellowship. You'll recall that last week we spoke about fear, fear. We saw that the Bible, and Jesus in particular, in Luke chapter 12, have a lot to say about fear and worry. And we're going to talk about worry once again today. Because as we saw last week, the past three pandemic years have really been a season where fear and hypocrisy, worry and greed have been given almost what seems to have been the perfect conditions to grow, spread, and thrive within the world, of course, but family, if we're honest, often within the church as well. Often leaving the church looking like the world rather than shining lights of God's hope and grace into the world. We saw last week that Jesus' word to his followers and his disciples are clear. Jesus reminds us that because of him, we don't need to fear the things of this world because we have a heavenly father who sees us and loves us deeply And we have his Holy Spirit who empowers and equips us to face the day. But today we're going to get more specific as we talk about worry and how worrying causes us to try and hold on to control, to wealth, and specifically our earthly possessions. Family, worrying affects our generosity and our witness. Worrying affects our generosity and our witness to the world. As Christians, we are called to generously love God and generously love others as we respond to Jesus' first and best, with our first and best, in every area of our lives. We are called to be salt and light to this world, to be His hands and His feet, to reach the lost, to feed the hungry, and to make disciples of all nations as Jesus calls us to live out abundant lives, and to draw others to Him. By believing in our hearts, confessing with our mouths, and showing with our actions, Jesus Christ is Lord. That's how others are drawn to Him. But let's be honest. How are we to do that 
in a post-pandemic world. A world that is gripped with fear, hypocrisy, worry, pessimism, indifference, suspicion, and greed. Well, we need to follow Jesus' example, which was and still is the complete antithesis to the way of the world. Family, we need to lay down our lives as Christ did, lay down our wants, our fears, our preferences, indeed, even our material wealth and possessions. And we are to use all of these things to love generously, love generously. But don't just take my word for it. Let's see what God's perfect and holy word has to say about this. As we come to our text for this morning, our text for today is Luke 12, verses 13 to 34. You can meet us in your Bibles, Luke 12, verses 13 to 34. It'll, either, it'll be on the screen or you can follow along on your Bible in, or on your device. Uh, and so let's read together Luke 12, verses 13 to 34, following on from last week. Verse 13, someone from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Friend, he said to him, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? He then told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed, because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Then he told them a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat. Drink and enjoy yourself. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Then he said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about the body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't have a storeroom or a barn, yet God feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than the birds? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? If then you're not able to do even a little thing, why worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass, which is in the field today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, how much more will he do for you? O oh, you of little faith. Don't strive for what you should eat and what you should drink, and don't be anxious. For the Gentile world eagerly seeks all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek His kingdom. Seek His kingdom, and these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your Father delights to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old, an inexhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Family of God, this is the word of the Lord, and so thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh, good, good, good God. Thank you for this time. We thank you that we can get together as believers in Christ Celebrate what you did, Jesus. Celebrate who we are in you, the victory over cross, the victory over sin and death. What a privilege it is to be able to be your people now, to be able to open your word, to be able to know you, God, to pray to you, to have a relationship with you, Lord God. I pray, Holy Spirit, now that you would come, use this word to bring truth into our lives. Would you speak, Holy Spirit? 
Lord God, would you have your way in us now? Lord God, you call us to your abundant life, to be a shining light, to make disciples of all nations, Lord God. And I pray that you would use this word now to equip us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Okay. Now, family, just a little bit of context for our text this morning. If you'd like some more context, you can go and take a listen to last week's message. But for the sake of time and focus this morning, I'll say this. Gospel of Luke, pretty much broken up in the following way. Remember, we said this last week, the first nine or so chapters of Luke's gospel, Luke shows how Jesus brings the good news of God's kingdom to the ani, the poor or those of low social status who are considered outsiders. And Luke emphasizes throughout his gospel that Jesus' kingdom is very much upside down. It's a reversal of the world's common social values. Next section of the Gospel of Luke, where we found our text for the series in Luke 12, forms part of the center section of the book of Luke. And in chapters 9 to 19, Jesus teaches more about trusting in God's provision and on possessions, money, and generosity than anywhere else in his teachings. In chapters 9 to 19 of Luke, Jesus teaches more about trusting in God's provision and on possessions, money, and generosity here than anywhere else in his teachings. You also remember last week that at the beginning of chapter 12, Jesus is heading out again towards Jerusalem. And as he did this, thousands more come to hear him teach. And then he begins to warn his followers against hypocrisy as he teaches on fear, encouraging his followers that they have nothing to fear in this world, not even death itself, and that instead they should fear or revere, love and worship their loving God, who is not a distant God, but he is one who even knows the number of hairs on their heads. And they need not fear rejection either, because Jesus will be rejected and even nailed to a cross so that they can be accepted And they don't need to fear the day that they will be brought before rulers and authorities like the Pharisees. For when that time comes, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, will be their comfort and will give them the words to say. Jesus follows, have nothing to fear. Amen. We have nothing to fear. And as we read these words, we realize that Jesus' words here at the beginning of Luke 12 are as relevant for us today in 2023 as they were the day he spoke them. And so that's where we pick up our text this morning as we dive deeper into Luke 12, verse 13. Luke 12, verse 13. Someone from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So here we have this person in the crowd who has just heard all that Jesus has had to say about not fearing the things of the world, not even death itself. And essentially his response is, I hear you but you don't know the problems that I'm facing. And so I'm asking you to step in now to tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me and prove you love me, prove you are for me, and essentially prove that you are the son of God. And don't we do the same? So often our problems in this world feel bigger. They feel bigger than death and all that Jesus assures us of. Lord, I know that my eternal life is secure with you, Jesus, and I know that you'll be with me if I'm facing persecution, Holy Spirit. And I know you love me, Father God, so much that you know the hairs on my head, the number of hairs on my head. But this problem I'm facing feels more, feels more pressing. I wonder how many of us felt that way last week after listening to the sermon. Perhaps that's how we feel every time we read something encouraging us not to fear. Lord, I hear you and your words are good and comfort me a little. But remember that personal problem, that concern of mine. I'm just reminding you about it, Lord. I don't quite think you've got this one. I think you may have overlooked it. Or maybe you're like, actually, God, this one's really big. I'm not sure you can handle this one. After all, I've been struggling with this one for a long, long time, for ages now, Lord. And so perhaps I should worry about it and stress about it. And then you'll have to step in, prove you're God. But also notice, family, I want you to notice the content of this man's concern. 
It's over his inheritance. And so what is he worrying about? He's worrying about money. Money. Now, Jesus is speaking to this man just over 2,000 years ago. And then, just as it is now, death and estates and families, material wealth and money is such a cause of worry and concern. In fact, perhaps it's something you're worrying about even right now as you sit here. Or perhaps I've just reminded you of this and you're beginning to worry. But stay with me. Because Jesus had some words for this man as he does for us today. Amen? Jesus says in verse 14, Friend, he said to him, who appointed me judge or arbitrator over you? Now there are a couple things at play here. This man is testing Jesus, not following him. And not only that, but this man is actually being greedy, as is so often the case when a death in the family occurs and inheritance comes into play. You see, family, under Jewish Mosaic law, as set out in Deuteronomy 21, verse 17, the elder son got two-thirds of the inheritance, whilst the younger son inherited the remaining third. Elder son, two-thirds. Younger son, one-third. Now, whilst this sounds harsh, it is actually incredibly wise and loving, as all laws that God gave to Moses were. Because by doing this, the elder brother, as the new head of the family, would be able to look after the family businesses, the legacy and estate, and to continue to take care of the family's dependents. On occasion, however, Jewish custom said that where this division of assets would not be wise, the younger brother could dispute this law before a Jewish rabbi or teacher. And this teacher could, in his authority, pronounce judgment over this dispute. And so here we have this younger brother wanting a fair an equal share. Split the inheritance with me. A fair and equal share. His solution to the dispute. Now, family, this is a sermon for another day, but there is no fair and equal share in the kingdom of God. If you want to find out more about that, go and take a listen to the sermon, Faithful Over a Few Things, on our podcast platforms, because in that time, we did a deep dive into Matthew 25, and we saw that there most certainly is justice There is righteousness and faithfulness in God's kingdom, but there is no fair and equal share. Those faithful over a few will be given more. And hear me, those who act unjustly and unrighteously will be held accountable, whether it be in this life or the next. In this life or the next. Go check that out. But back to our text today. So here in Luke 12, we have this man disputing a law and he's challenging it, most probably so that he can profit at his family's expense. And so Jesus does a number of things. Firstly, he says to the man, who appointed me arbiter over you? And by doing this, he is saying to the man that he has not come as a mere worldly authority to focus and judge and obsess over worldly disputes and concerns. But rather, he is the all-knowing, all-powerful Son of God whose main focus and concern was to bring the good news to the poor and usher in the kingdom of God. But Jesus is also rhetorically asking this man if he has truly put his trust in Jesus, or is he merely in his greed seeking an outwardly worldly authority to solve his dispute, looking for someone to be on his side and back him up. He's like a toddler selectively going and telling one of his parents or caregivers his version of the dispute with his brother. But is this man truly submitting to Jesus Christ as Lord? Or is he in his greed only looking to get some worldly material wealth from Jesus instead? Family, are we truly submitting to Jesus Christ as Lord? Or are we in our greed looking to get some worldly material wealth from Jesus instead? Entire churches have been built on that, that principle. And so then Jesus seizes the opportunity to teach on greed. He takes the opportunity to teach on greed and to contrast greed to the countercultural ways of God's kingdom. Generosity. Provision. Verse 15, he, he then told them, watch out. And be on guard against all greed, because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Last week, we saw that Jesus warned against hypocrisy and how that can cause his true followers to fear. 
And this morning, we have Jesus warning against greed. And what does greed lead us to do, family? Track with me, verse 16. Then Jesus told them a parable. Parable, simple story used to illustrate a point. So Jesus tells them this simple story used to illustrate a point. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I can only imagine if this was today, I could see him posting a selfie standing in front of his flourishing fields (laughs) on social media with the caption, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? Hashtag farm life, hashtag agriculture, hashtag growth, hashtag goals. (laughs) And he would undoubtedly get the response, bro, this sounds like you got big hashtag first world problems. Continuing on, verse 18, I will do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. I guess that's one way to do it, one way to live your life. Another option could have been to give it away to the poor and the vulnerable in Israel at the time, the Ani, those very people who Jesus came to bring the good news to. But this man's greed had caused him to become incredibly selfish. His greed had led him to become selfish. Verse 19, Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. Does that slogan sound familiar? Isn't that what we are bombarded with every second as we pass billboards online, on streaming services, as we consult worldly advice? Take it easy, eat, drink, enjoy yourself. Because another lie of this world is that this is the meaning of this life. You should always do the easy thing. Chillax, grab a seat, eat your full, drink up, enjoy yourself. This is the meaning of life. And family, it's a lie that this rich man, like so many others over the course of time, have completely bought into And it's a lie that if we're honest, some of us sometimes buy into as well. Verse 20, but God, but God, whenever you see those two words written in God's word, you know the script is about to be flipped. But God said to him, you fool, this very night after your feast and after your party, your life is demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Whose will they be? It won't be yours any longer. All those things that this man spent his entire life focused on worrying about, concerning himself with, they'll all be left behind. And so Jesus goes on to warn all of those who find themselves like this greedy, selfish, foolish man. And he says in verse 21, that's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Family, material wealth, possessions, earthly pleasures, they neither give life in this life or the next life, nor do they provide security because death separates us from these things in this world. And in this parable, we can so clearly see that this greedy and selfish rich man so foolishly looked upon his earthly possessions and his pleasures as his own, believing that they had been earned by his own competency for his purpose of his own edification. Instead, instead of wisely recognizing them for what they were, gifts from God to be used faithfully, justly, generously, and unselfishly for the furthering of God's kingdom, for the glory of God. Rooted Fellowship, last week Jesus warned his followers not to dread and fear the pain, the suffering, and the inconveniences in this world. As Jesus follows, we don't need to fear those things. We don't need to push them away and and worry and fear them. But here, now, in these next verses, he now warns them not to be too enamored and too obsessed with the things and the pleasures of this world either. And then he doubles down on this teaching as he gets really specific and contrasts some of the things of this world with the eternal kingdom of God. 
verses 22 and 23. Then he said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, don't worry. Look to your favorite neighbor and say, don't worry. Now look to your second favorite neighbor and say, don't worry. You see, there's no fair and equal share in the kingdom of God. (laughs) Everyone say, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry about your life, what you will eat or about the body, what you will wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Some of y'all have just started wondering, what are we having for lunch? (laughs) Hope it's chicken. Jesus says, don't worry. Don't worry. And in order to illustrate this point, Jesus tells his followers to spend some time in nature observing God. Because Jesus knows that many of us, and I include myself here, we need to stop fixating on our own stuff. And Jesus knows that we need to lift our gaze off of our own problems and spend some time in nature, gazing upon the wonder, the beauty, the majesty, the enormity of our God and his creative genius. Amen? Amen. Psalm 121 Verses one to two says, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord above, the maker of heaven and earth. I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so then Jesus goes on to highlight two examples of God's gracious and generous provision in nature. The first of which we read in verse 24. Consider the ravens. Last week we looked at sparrows. This week it's ravens. Now some of y'all are really wondering what you're having for for lunch, if it's going to be chicken. Jesus says to us, consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't have a storeroom or a barn like the greedy, selfish, and foolish man. And yet God feeds them. God feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than the birds? Theologians have said that humankind is the crown of God's creation. He made no other creature in his image. Jesus came to die for us, family. And so aren't we much worth much more than the birds? Absolutely we are. And so we can rely on his provision. And then Jesus asks, verse 25, can any of you add one moment to his life by worrying? Can any of you add one moment to his life by worrying? Of course we can't. The only thing worrying adds is anxiety and stress and possibly even ulcers. But it doesn't add time to our life. The irony is is that it in actual fact steals time. It takes away our joy and our presence in the moment. And so Jesus says, verse 26, If then you are not able to do even a little thing, why worry about the rest? Think about this for a moment. If then you are not able to do even this a little thing, why worry about the rest? So much is out of our control. But this shouldn't cause us to feel helpless, family. It shouldn't cause us to feel helpless because Jesus isn't done. He makes use of another example of God's gracious and generous provision in nature. Verse 27, he says, Consider how the wild flowers grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon, who was the wealthiest king in Israel's history, not he, in all his splendor, was adorned like one of these. And so verse 28, if that's how God clothes the grass, which is in the field today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, how much more will he do for you? You of little faith. You of little faith. And that's the issue, really, isn't it? That's the issue. We know that God cares for his creation. He provides for his creatures and his beloved children. And yet, we often don't have faith that he will provide for us. We we often don't think that he will provide for us. We know that you are a good Lord. We have seen you provide for others, and we've seen you provide for us in the past. And yet, I'm not sure that I can trust you today with this one. Dr. Tony Evans tells the story of how he was invited to go on a speaking trip and he asked his wife to go with him. And at first she declined the invitation because they would need to make the journey on a very small light engine plane. 
Now, smaller planes are often considered less safe and a bit more of a bumpier ride. But then, over time, plans, schedules, and dates changed, and as it happened, it turned out that he would be able to fly on the usual domestic airline-type plane. And then when his wife heard that, she said, oh, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm coming with. You see, fam, when it comes to air travel, the size of our faith is often linked to the size of our plane. And in this life, the size of our faith is often linked to our trust in God, and more specifically, what we believe about the size of our God. The size of our faith is linked to what we believe about the size of our God. Is God bigger or smaller than the challenges that we face? Family, this morning I'm here to remind us that our God is greater. Sing it with me. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, that's our God. Amen. And so family, because of that, Jesus says, verse 29, don't strive for what you should eat and what you should drink. Don't strive. That word strive means to do something in our own strength. And so don't worry for what you should eat and what you should drink in your own strength. And indeed, don't be anxious, verse 30, for the Gentile or the unbelieving world eagerly seeks all these things. But remember, fam, Jesus calls us to be set apart from this world. And he then says that your father knows that you need them. He knows what you need. And so don't be worried and anxious. And then just like last week, Jesus doesn't just tell his followers not to be anxious. In his grace and in his wisdom, he tells them how not to be worried and anxious. As he tells us what to replace our worry and anxiety with. Verse 31, he says, but seek his kingdom and these things will be provided for you. And as you do this, verse 32, don't be afraid, little flock, because your father delights to give you the kingdom. Jesus tells us that if his followers are to seek after his kingdom, we need not worry or be afraid because God will see us and our needs and he will give us the kingdom. But Jono, what does this practically look like? What does it practically look like to seek and receive the kingdom? Well, Jesus again in his grace tells us, verse 33 and 34, sell your possessions and give to the poor, the ani. Those in need, the social outsiders and the outcasts, give to them. Make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old, an inexhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Brother and sister in the Lord, where is your treasure this morning? Where's your heart at? Is it in the things of this world? Are you worrying about and obsessing over the things of this world? Making contingency plans? If that happens, then I'm gonna do this. And if that happens, then I'm gonna do that. And if that other thing happens, then I'll make sure that I'll do that. Will we have enough? And if we have enough, will our loved ones have enough? And now that we, with the rising interest rates and the near recession, will we actually ever have enough? Perhaps we should build barns and storehouses just to make sure, just in case. Joshua Becker, he's a Christian who used to be a pastor and now writes on minimalism, says that the average American household no longer uses their garage to park their vehicles in, opting instead to use it for stuff, with many also renting off-site storage units. You notice how that business is booming at the moment, off-site storage units? Now, you may say, Jono, that's, that's American stats, and sure, that's American stats, but to the highly competent, highly gifted, upper to middle, class, middle to upper class folks gathered here at Rooted Fellowship this morning, I ask us, where are you storing up your treasures? Are you accumulating more and more stuff, working tirelessly to earn more and more wealth? Brother and sister, is all this striving causing you to be worried and anxious? Have you dropped your gaze down and become fixated on the things of this world? Causing you to become greedy, selfish, 
even foolish. I was listening to the radio on Friday, and researchers from the University of Free State have been doing studies on how South Africans are doing, specifically in response to load shedding. And it won't surprise you to know that we're not okay. We are not okay. Anger is on the up. We're angry. Fear and anxiety is higher than it's, than it's possibly ever been, but it's higher than it was this time last year. Because of the real effects of load shedding, there are real consequences to it. People are losing livelihoods. But I'd add to that, the, the, I'd add to that list the long-lasting consequences of the pandemic, along with global and local political uncertainty and instability. And so how are things with post-pandemic me? How are things with post-pandemic me? How are we doing? Well, last week, we saw that we were hypocritical and fearful as we dreaded the pain, suffering, and inconveniences of this world. But God, amen? But God replaced, places our fear with love, awe, and reverence to our good Father. Jesus removed our fear of rejection and he replaced it with the assurance of his victory over this world and his unconditional acceptance of us. And finally, our fear of ridicule and persecution was replaced with the confidence that we have in the Holy Spirit to teach us what to do and what to say when those times come. And this week, this week, how are things with post pandemic me? How are we doing? Well, we've seen that we're anxious, we're angry, we're worried. It's been said that as Christians, we often don't live in Jesus' victory, that same victory we sang about. We don't often live in that victory that Jesus had over the cross. But instead, we crucify ourselves between two thieves. Regret for yesterday and fear of tomorrow. Regret for yesterday and fear of tomorrow. But family, today, I want you to think about this. Today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Let that sink in. Today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. We need to stop allowing the worrying of today, of tomorrow, rob us of God's grace and strength today. Amen? We need to stop allowing the worry of tomorrow rob us of today's strength. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish. For his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. Amen. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 22 to 22. God is faithful. He is constant. And he will provide. But church, I think post-pandemic, post-pandemic, we are anxious. And we are worried. And family, in some ways, it's caused us, let's be honest, to be greedy, to be selfish, and to be foolish. But Jesus says to us that we are to seek and receive the kingdom of God. Seek and receive the kingdom of God. To stop striving and obsessing over accumulating wealth for here and for now. And instead, not to fear but to trust God for today and to sell our possessions and give to the poor. To make investments that will never grow old and an exhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moths destroy to invest in the eternal future treasures of heaven. Family, there's a well-known principle in finance and accounting. I consulted an expert on this. And there's a well-known principle in finance and accounting that emphasizes the importance of investing in the future instead of withdrawing from it and decreasing your investment's value. The principle is commonly referred to as the time value of money. And the time value of money principle suggests that it is generally more beneficial to invest for the long term rather than withdrawing it prematurely. And so family, Rooted Fellowship, I ask myself and I ask you, where are you investing your time, treasures, and talents? And Bumi mentioned them this morning. Are you investing your time, treasures, and talents here? Or are you investing them somewhere else? Are you withdrawing them to use them in the fleeting here and now? 
Are we out there advancing our careers and our agendas, but giving little to no time, treasures and talents to the kingdom of God? Brother and sister, if you can't remember the last time you shared the gospel, that's an indication that you're withdrawing your kingdom investment prematurely. Are you making time to engage with non-Christians where you work, live, and play? Are you shining his light in your community? Are you reaching out to the yani, the poor, the social outsiders, and those in need? I'm going to call the band up as I ask us a few more questions. The band can come up. Family, I want to ask you, how are your investments in your Bible study, your prayer times, your devotions? How's that going? Are you making daily deposits or weekly withdrawals? Are they the first thing we look at in the morning? Friend, God's got your daily needs covered. That email, that text, social media, it can wait. Are we showing up to our devotional times and our Bible study times very much preoccupied, worrying, just getting through it, just worrying about what's coming next when our day really gets going? Instead of sitting at our heavenly Father's feet, listening to Him, praying to Him, sharing our heart with Him. Family, I'm asking us, when was the last time you served in church or attended family group? And fam, please note that I didn't say when you showed up on Sunday and gathered. That is important, but I said served. Served your family. And you say, Jono, it's just, um, listen, I'm, in a, I'm, in, I'm seeking work-life balance, you know? I was involved in those serving ministries for many years. I think it's time for me just to sit back and receive a bit. Or maybe you're saying, man, I'm coming from church hurts, and I'm in a season of healing and, and learning to say no to things. Wonderful. We're thankful that you're here. Praise Jesus. Come up here to the prayer corner. Come chat to us, and let's chat about a timeline for your healing and about some of the, your unique circumstances. Say no to the things of this world. Help us love and serve you. Pray for you. Perhaps even connect you with a counselor. But then let's figure out a way for you to get plugged in and serving. Serving in the family and the kingdom of God. Family, come and invest in the kingdom. Come invest in the things of God because this reveals where our hearts, faith, and trust truly lie. Or perhaps you are serving here, and we praise God for this. Every single ambassador here, we praise God for you. But I'm gonna ask us, how are we showing up? Are we serving only to get something in return? Bargaining with God? God, I'll, I'll do that if you, if you do this. Come through for me here, I'll do that. Are we guarding our preparation times leading up to serving and meeting with folks? Are we serving God excellently in our preparations, arriving ready to serve, having rested well the night before? Or are we preparing ourselves just quickly in a rush on the freeway and speeding in here late again after yet another busy, busy, full-on weekend? What about all of our stuff? What does that look like after the challenges of the past few years? You see, for a while there, we were operating in survival mode. We've been operating in survival mode. And it's caused us to latch onto everything we own. Much like the foolish, greedy, and selfish man in the parable. Or perhaps it's time, family, to get rid of all those items we're keeping in the extra storage units or the barns of our lives. Perhaps it's time to give away all of those things that we no longer need. You know what they are for you. For for me, it's sports gear, kitchen stuff. For you, it could be clothing, shoes, appliances, knickknacks. Why not bless someone else in the community who needs them, who really needs them? What about our homes? For so long during COVID, we got used to them being our little sanctuary where no one other than maybe our blood families were allowed family post-pandemic, perhaps it's time to invite your blood-bought family over for a coffee or a meal again. No matter what the place looks like, let's begin to open up our homes to those in need again. We heard testimonies during Christian of the Day of what good hospitality looked like. People who didn't necessarily know someone else, but knew that that person was in need and met them in their needs. 
And you know what? It wasn't them that met them. God met them through that person. Family of God, we get to participate in the kingdom of God. Are we making ourselves available to participate in the kingdom of God and being a blessing to others, those in need? And Jesus spoke about, speaks about money in Luke 9 to 19, and so I'm gonna speak about money. What about our giving? Family of God, if you call Rooted Home, are we giving cheerfully, sacrificially, intentionally, and regularly to the Lord's work here? Are you open with your finances, inviting your leaders to hold you accountable to tithing for your good and for God's glory? Or has the pandemic caused your finances and a lack of intentional giving to spiral out of control? Again, if this is an area that you're struggling with, come talk to us. We have folks who are gifted in this area of finances. We have folks who are gifted in the area of decluttering. Come, talk to us. They are willing to help. And so won't you open yourself up to being assisted? Don't be proud. Don't be foolish. Family, your actions have an impact on your community. There's no such thing as sin that doesn't affect anyone else. And so why not lean on family? As elder couples, we've said that when it comes to giving our treasures, we want to model this by going first, which means being open with the other elder couples about how much we give to the Lord's work here at Rooted. It means opening up our homes and being hospitable. When it was eat and run and we never had enough hosts, we felt the Lord directing us as elder couples to each host a second meal. And so family, what am I saying? What am I saying is this. We are not calling you to something that we as leaders aren't doing. And we are certainly not calling you to anything Jesus is not already calling us to do. Family, for many of us, all the fear and the worrying from the pandemic has caused us to get into some bad habits. And in some situations, it's caused us to reprioritize things, to latch onto things, and to hold back from participating joyfully in the kingdom of God. Let's confess that to God. Let's confess that to one another. Let's give it over to Him. The the time has come to lay it down. Let's lay these things down and leave this place once again, just like we did last week, a changed people, a generous people, secure in the victory, hope, and provision that we have in our God. A generous, healed, and restored people on mission to see the world awaken to the wonder of God and His beautiful transcultural church. Amen? We're gonna respond in in prayer and then we're gonna respond in songs. I'm gonna invite you to stand now as we pray together. Holy Father, you are good. Let that belief rise up in us now, Lord God. You are good. You are over our health. You are good over our needs, over our nation, over our leaders, over our jobs, Lord God, over our future jobs, over our children, over this church, Lord God. And so, Lord God, we ask, let faith and trust arise. And would fear and and anxiety and worry die in Jesus' name? We speak the name of Jesus against them and we speak the name of Jesus over every area of our lives. As as we respond now, Lord God, in the words of the song that we're gonna be singing, would we respond with all of our lives as well? Would we surrender our time, our talents, our treasures and all the concerns of our lives to you? Would you have your way in them, Lord? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the assurance that we have that your Holy Spirit is at work in our lives. And so come. Come, Holy Spirit, move amongst us in a deep, profound way. Lord God, we know how the story ends. We know how the story ends. In you, we have assurance, we have victory, we have hope, we have trust, we have love, we have unity, we have generosity, we have provision, we have all things we need in you, Jesus. And so may we remember this now, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for healing us, for restoring us post this pandemic, Lord. We wait on you eagerly as we get to observe your goodness and faithfulness in our lives. And Lord God, we come before you confessing that we have often been greedy over the things that you've given us instead of seeing them as gifts, Lord. Thank you that every good thing comes from you, Lord God, and it is a gift from you. Thank you for the family in our lives, blood family. Thank you for blood-bought family, Lord God. Thank you for opportunities, for goodness, for nature, Lord God. We thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. May we honor you, Lord God, by loving and serving you 
by using these gifts for your glory, for our good, to further your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.